yesterday uh, and I though I'm involved in the R&D side specifically Ethereum 2, what, what's next for Ethereum? Uh, my name is Emil Yunsir, I'm a professor at Cornell, I'm a co-founder at Bloxrail Labs where uh, I believe we are one of the main efforts on the, at layer zero, uh, looking at the network level and how to make that fast. And uh, I'm also a founder of Ava Labs which is building a new coin based on the avalanche consensus protocol. Hello everyone, my name is Frederick. I'm the CTO of Petty Technologies and we build core infrastructure. That means we have an Ethereum client, uh, that's one of the main ones, a Bitcoin client, we're working now on a Zcash client, perhaps more notably we're working on Polkadot clients and we're also building a framework for building blockchains, uh, and which is called Substrate. Hi everybody, I'm Nicolas Bacar, CTO and co-founder of Ledger. So Ledger is manufacturing security solutions for blockchain infrastructure. And my role as, at Ledger is mostly to supervise the evolution of the platform of those different business units that we have, so hardware wallets, uh, enterprise and IoT. Hi, I'm Eli Ben Sasson, I'm chief scientist at Starkware, also co-founder there. I'm also a professor of computer science at uh, Technion, Israel Institute of Technology and one of the founding scientists of uh, Zcash. Thanks for having me. Okay, can you guys hear us down the back? Is it um, going up? Yeah, can you hear now? Does this microphone work better? So we got it. Yeah, of course the weather. Yeah, no, it does. <laughs> okay, is that in a minute? No, it wasn't. So this is awesome. We've got literally an entire next generation uh, blockchain ecosystem sitting right here. Um, a leadless protocol, leadless blockchain protocol, a next generation Ethereum client. Um, we've got parity with uh, with. Substrate, which is, is itself a, a huge collection of tools, um, as well as Polkadot, which is an uh, tool for chain interconnection. We've got the key management, the hardware key management, which is actually a really interesting subject. Um, uh, and then also we've got zero knowledge proofs, which I think has really changed the way we understand what it is possible, like what is possible to do with communication today. And it's, it's really, this stuff has completely changed the way we think about it. Um, the, the way we think about communication. So, well, also we, we also have Ethereum killer on, on my list. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah, well, not. <laughs> well, no, it's uh, cra the crazy sister, really. That's the uh, that's line. But um, but so, do you guys see a uh, a role for all of these uh, these enterprise solutions and uh, public blockchain solutions interfacing or uh, a world in which they interface through? A, uh, a tool like Polkadot. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's a big part of what why we're building Polkadot. I mean, I, th I think it's obvious that there's a lot of interest from an enterprise in building their own blockchains, but they have different requirements than a public blockchain does. But they still want to be able to interact with a public blockchain. So the, the example that I usually take is you might have a private network or a consortium network of universities sharing uh, educational certificates. And you don't want this to be public information. But from a public blockchain, if you have a smart contract, for instance, that requires you to have a certain education, you can query that private blockchain 
and that private blockchain can respond back to the public one with, for instance, a zero-knowledge proof saying, yes, this person does have this in, in, uh, education, and the only, you, you only reveal that one bit of information. Um, and so having something like Polkadot that allows that connection to happen in a decentralized, trustless way, I think, is extremely important. So you've already mentioned immediately zero knowledge proofs. Um, so can, could you give us a bit of an idea about what we should expect from um, this field in the future? I mean, Starkware is kind of at the forefront of that, absolutely. Yeah, so um, I think the notion of privacy through zero knowledge proofs is already uh, well understood or starting to be understood through such things as uh, Zcash and its use of zero knowledge proofs there. Um, I think that the next step, and that's actually what Starks and Starkler is about, is the aspect of scalability. And scalability through Starks are achieved because verifying the correctness of a computation scales exponentially faster than conducting or verifying that computation naively. So if you take thousands of transactions or millions of transactions and you want someone else to process them and prove to the rest of the network that the processing was done correctly, that's exactly where Starks are going to be used. You could use them with uh, privacy, with zero knowledge, or you could use them without if you're only interested in the scalability aspects. Another point about privacy is that one should think of privacy as this sort of uh, you know, dial that you can turn to the right uh, amount that you want. So it's not an all or nothing thing. You can have various grades of regulated privacy that will allow various parties to see or uh, uh, surmise certain aspects of the transactions that are deemed necessary. So it's not an all or nothing thing, and I'm not sure it should be an all or nothing thing. So we'll see great and zero knowledge, and the next frontier, uh, that's the one we're embracing at Starkware, is going to be scalability through proofs. So well, with that said, yeah, um, Emin, you're actually working on a, uh, on a next generation protocol as well. Yeah, I wanted to say a few words about this all or nothing property of privacy. Um, I think there's a common misconception, or com th th there's a way that developers learn from each other and copy from each other. One of the things that they typically copy is this one coin, one scripting language idea. So we've got coins that do one thing and one thing alone. I think we're going to see an end of that. We're going to see coins that are able to mix and match various features. So for example, the Ava coin that we're working on is going to support, or you know, is planned to support, multiple scripting languages. And so you can easily define on that platform a new coin where you say, I want you know, the Bitcoin scripting language so I can use Bitcoin wallets. But I also want to be able to uh, have ring signatures or you know, ZKPs or whatever else. And so um, I think it's time to think about not launching a new coin for every single idea with its own dedicated scripting language, but about unifying these things and we're hoping that, uh, that the platform that we're developing is going to give us that. So we've talked about, uh, about platforms and privacy, um, but what about actual key management and, uh, and storage? I mean, we're getting to the point where, well, actually, go for it. I'm sure you can, uh, you can, you can fill this in here. Yeah, so uh, I think something, something I learned from blockchain, which is quite different from where I was coming from initially. So I was coming from the old world where people were designing banking passports and banking cards, and at some point I got tired of doing that. Uh, because I realized that those objects only uh, allowed people to store secrets that didn't belong to them. So they were very good at storing secrets, but in the end you were not uh, able to use them and you were not able to own those secrets. So, uh, one thing that, blockchain, that I learned with blockchain is that it gives a way for people to own their own key and to think about what is the ownership, what means the ownership of a key. So what you should be careful when you are doing that and where you should be, what you should be looking at. So uh, all those new protocols are bringing something very new to key management. So we have to think about different properties of the keys that we are storing. So I think that today we know how to store private keys for a simple blockchain on which we are just doing uh, basically signature validation. Uh, but we, when we start thinking about privacy coins, when we start thinking about start, 
we have different keys, we have different uh, levels on which those keys are stored, for example. We can afford to store keys are uh, meant for privacy and some key management system that will be much faster than something that's more secure. We still want to store the keys that manage the transaction on some things that is really secure. Uh, so we have to live and learn uh, to use different key management systems that interact with each other. So it will be interesting to see uh, how we manage that because today, well, we have single systems when we have them, so we have HSMs. Uh, we, are trying, we are starting to think about more powerful systems to handle those kind of uh, highly computational requirements that we have with, uh, with uh, zero knowledge pool, for example, using trusted uh, computing. So we have to see how those systems interact with each other, how we can mix them together. And I think we will learn that we, have, we don't really have one way to fit them all. So the next generation key management system will be a mix of very different technologies. What will the capabilities of this next generation um, key management system, what will this allow us to do and how will that actually change our daily lives? That's so one, one technical thing I mean, that we don't have today, for example, in key management system is we have to, we have to, take a, we have to put a switch between performance, security, and the memory that we have on those key management systems. So on the typical key management system that we have today, they are highly secure, uh, but they, don't have, they are not very performant and they don't have a lot of storage of RAM. So when we want to compute proof, we need to have usually a lot more RAM than those key management systems currently, currently support. And then when we want to think about key revocation, then we need, to, we need to invent new things as well. Because today, if we consider a typical key management system, we still have issues from PKI that were not solved in the past, uh, maybe 30, 40 years. Uh, so that's extremely complex to, to handle. Uh, even the key recovery problem on which we made a lot of progress with our blockchain, because uh, since the Bitcoin standard, we learned from we learn a way to store all of our digital identity in 24 words, for example, uh, but that's definitely not good enough for top price. So we have to think about recovery as, as well. And I believe that we have we are just seeing that we are just seeing the blueprints of what would be those next generation key management systems. So we have still a lot of work to do in key recovery, in how we manage uh, how we manage authorizations, how we manage revocation of authorization, and how we manage the different sides of the storage of the new generation key that we have handled. So let me just, I have a question and a comment. So first of all, thank you very much for all the work you've done. I'm a big fan. And uh, the big question is, can you please possibly make the user experience easy enough for the Wall Street types to be able to use this stuff? So uh, that's, I think, one of the main, uh, main issues holding back the custodial uh, relationships. Yeah, so for that, I think that at some point we have to We'll also have a lot of work to do in the US because today, when you interact with uh, when you interact with the blockchain, you have to understand the underlying mechanism that powers the blockchain to know what you are doing. And typically, when you are sending Bitcoin, for example, if you don't know what is a change transaction, you won't understand that you are sending back coins to yourself when you are consuming when you are sending money to someone. So if and hiding that leads to other problems. So I mean. Uh, Maybe I don't want to get into too many details, but for example, if you are deriving keys uh, to make sure that the change belongs to yourself, you open an attack vector when somebody could derive a very long path that you are not able to find. And in simplifying the UX, you would have introduced a way for people to basically, uh, basically, I mean, ask you for money to give them back the change path and recover you, your keys. So managing UX is very important, uh, but we have to make sure that we are not making any, we are not making too many. Uh, drawbacks regarding the end-to-end secu end security of the system. So, um, so there's key management. What about these next generation protocols? We're just talking, um, you know, um, Ava being a legal system. Um, what is the need for a new generation protocols? And can you actually uh, describe what you think the, uh, the characteristics of these new protocols will be? Sure. So. Um... I think so. What is the need for a new uh, for a new platform? I think it's very clear that the the dream that we've sold to the masses is very compelling. It's the dream that has brought us all into this room. It's the dream that you know I, I know very well how I felt when I read the first uh, when I read the Satoshi white paper, and I know everybody here in this room probably can remember that day where they thought, hey, there's something really cool going on here. The dream is amazing, and it's it's we're nowhere near it, right? So we're going to know if we reached it when all of our stocks and so forth that we hold are in crypto form, and we're nowhere near that. So 
Um, and can we reach that dream with today's technology? I posit to you that, that the orders of magnitude and scale that is required is just unachievable with the technology we have. Proof of work is wonderful, but I can't really just you know, go and look at a bunch of young people and try to get them excited about the technology that will melt the polar ice caps and uh, you know, put them into polar bears or whatnot. So, and maybe some of you don't care, and in fact in some circles, you know, people really are very, very selfish and they don't that it's okay to kill the environment. Um, for those people, the argument is you're leaking value out of your stored value system. So that's also not a very good idea. So I think the, the properties of a good system is that it should scale, it should be green, it should be quiescent. When there's nothing to do, there should, you shouldn't do anything. And, uh, and it takes a lot of changes to go from where we are to that world. And in the 10 years from, since Satoshi, what have we seen? We've seen reparameterization of the Satoshi idea. You take the code, you put it on a couple of parameters, you've got silver to Satoshi's gold, and you've got some palladium to whatever. So you get all these, all these copycat coins, um, all of which are, are very interesting to me, at least as a techie. Um, and we're seeing now uh, experimentation with other protocols, but uh, typically they, they tend to be fragile. We need to have a robust solution that can take over, uh, that provides the ability for everyone to participate. And that brings me to my last point, which is governance. I think all of our problems that we've, we've encountered uh, in over human history have to do with trying to figure out what people want and giving it to them. And uh, so that's the governance problem. And, uh, and coins that allow people to express their wishes, coins that allow people to keep their communities united, while figuring out what it is that unites them, the point of operation that makes the most people happy, those will have an edge up. And I don't know that Ava is the only solution, but it's certainly one of them. Uh, and there might be many other techniques to get at the same problem. I welcome them all. And, uh, and I think we're going to see a fantastic future ahead in this coming year. I suspect that there are many other entrants and many other players who have uh, great ideas. And I would love to see the, the best of them shake out. So, polar bear friendly. <laughs> so, okay. Now that brings me to Pegasus. And Pegasus is, is, I mean, for one, it's like it's awesome as being largely developed out of Brisbane, which is great because it's good to see the activities represented. Um, but uh, you guys have plug and play consensus, and one of the things that you guys have is um, one, of the, one of the models you support is proof of authority. And I was wondering if that is related to the work that Parity's doing. Right, so uh, we should say that, so Pegasus, we've made this uh, client, Pantheon, and it's a mainnet client, and it supports all the proof of work and all of that, of course, as existing Ethereum mainnet does. However, one of the key goals for Pegasus is to support enterprise deployments. Now, there, there are short-term and long-term horizons on this, and we've talked, talked a little bit already about the long-term horizons, and I think in five, six, seven years, there will be convergence and enterprises will deploy on Ethereum 2 or something very like it. However, in the meantime, uh, enterprise consortium networks are a thing. Uh, they don't want to be running proof of work nodes. This is, this is crazy. They want transaction throughputs in the thousands to ten thousands per second. So in order to achieve that, you need different consensus mechanisms. So proof of authority is one of these. It's basically a permissioned network. The, uh, the participants agree who is allowed to run nodes which contribute to the network. Uh, there are a number of proof of authority uh, protocols like uh, Parity, uh, yours is Aura, right? Um, the Ethereum Foundation GEF runs Click. We're actually implementing first a protocol called IVFT. Uh, which was developed um, by Amis Labs uh, last year or a couple of years ago, and uh, that has some nice properties as well. We've actually improved it somewhat. We have IBFT version two, which uh, has better liveness and so forth. What's what's IBFT stand for? Istanbul Byzantine Fault Tolerance. Oh, okay, nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, okay, so. <laughs> So this is interesting then. So you guys are actually working on a similar problem, but from two different directions. As in with, with the, the proof parity of proof of authority. Yeah, I mean, the, the kind of, the, these enterprise consortium networks tend to be monolithic in the sense that the participants will run the same client software. So you know, each party can do their own thing. Um, I, the intention is uh, to uh, implement the other testnet protocols like, like uh, Clique and uh, Aura 
in, in due course and participate in those test nets. Uh, in fact, we're already running on Rinkaby, which is the get clean uh, provable therapy network. So I, I would just add one thing to that and say that I mean um, the, the use case that I covered for Polkadot is is one of them. I, I can agree more with the tech we have today is utterly unsatisfying. Uh, like it, it just isn't anywhere near where we want it to be. Uh, so a big part of Polkadot is, is supporting anything. It can be a private network, but also any blockchain that anyone wants to build can, can connect to. The problem we have with innovating in the blockchain space is uh, once you create a blockchain, you need to have security on it. If, it. if it's a proof of work chain, you need miners to mine it. If it's a proof of stake chain, you need people to put up economic stake. And that's not easy and it's finite. You need to build that community around everything. And in reality, what we see is every one but the top sort of three, four chains are easily attackable. Uh, and so the, the point of Polkadot is also to provide this shared security pool where hopefully we can build a strong enough community in Polkadot that anyone that builds a new chain and connects it to Polkadot automatically gets all of that security for free. So you can easily innovate, you can create a blockchain, you can build it, you can ship it, and you have new security from day one. You! Um, awesome. So, <clears throat> then what does this look like <clears throat> as an industry roadmap? Because essentially you guys are, are the, the stalwarts or the, the avant-garde pushing this whole industry forward. So how will we see the technologies that you guys are developing uh, interact over the next, say, two years? And what new capabilities will they give us? That's it. <laughs> uh, I can say a word about Ethereum too. This is what I'm, what I'm focused on. So there, there's a balance. There's a balance for doing between doing the uh, amazing new thing that uh, Arbor is uh, looking at and, and Gun and uh, his colleagues uh, and between being very conservative because the Ethereum network has a lot of users, a lot of value uh, and we really don't want to break it. So there's a, you know, we want to push the boundaries as researchers but also we need to kind of play it somewhat safe. So we are working on protocols which are somewhat well understood and, and, and well tested. Of course it will be proof of stake uh, rather than proof of work uh, and sharded so that there will be um, parallel independent execution so we can get a thousand times more performance out of the system. Now within two years we'll be developing this in, and delivering it in stages. So the first stage is a beacon chain which is a sort of foundation coordination layer for the whole of the rest of the system. It runs the proof of stake mechanism and it provides a security for the sharded system. This, uh, we're looking at getting test nets together around March next year. Uh, it won't be useful for anything, but it will be a proof, uh, a foundation for the next stage, which is the sharded system to come sometime after that. That probably takes us up to our two year boundary. So here's my take on this. So I think Arthur's question wasn't so much what's the tech you see coming in, but how will it shake out? How will the, the competition play out? And, and so this is kind of interesting, right? So we're building a coin that's a platform, and some people might think, hey, this, this is in competition with XYZ. So I see absolutely no conflict and no competition in the years ahead. The market to be had is so huge and the space, the design space, is so large that we will naturally find our niches. And, uh, and the last thing I would want to do is, is go out in a head-on competition with a community this vibrant, with a community this strong. So, in fact, I feel part of this community as well. So, um, so as a result, this is what I see happening. I think the entire space will either rise together or sink together. So, uh, so I think this is, uh, it's up to us. There will be some communities that will insulate themselves. There are certain narratives that strengthen the community at the risk of its growth. There are communities that are very well known, but I will not name them, that are a little bit inward oriented, that have narratives that are, um, you know, that are hostile to all sorts of things like using the coin, etc. Et so those communities will end up self-limiting themselves, while the ones that are open, that are aggressive in, in going after new use cases will end up uh, attracting more people and will hopefully develop this new technology that we're all looking forward to. Yeah, I mean, uh, our bet is obviously the opposite of one coin to rule them all. I mean, we're betting that 
there will exist many different points and things in, in this world. But our playbook here is not so much that we think that we can invent it all. That's why we're building Substrate. We want to make it super easy for everyone else to build it all. Uh, and so they don't have to rebuild all of the sort of trivial things that uh, goes into building a blockchain now. So we're really betting on you, know, you guys out here to actually build stuff that is valuable and then um, you know, hopefully Polkadot helps along that way as well to you know, provide the security and other things. Uh, Pons has a challenge of a key management system uh, in the light of all those uh, various blockchains to stay as transparent and as flexible as possible. Uh, so being flexible is kind of the opposite of what you, you would expect for a key management system because you expect something to be very secure and usually something very secure is something that is uh, more static I mean, in the light of what people could imagine. Uh, so the idea is to find a way to add some new properties to your key management system so it could be a way to add new application support, it could be a way to add new UX support for something that you want to, to change, uh, it could be a way to also adapt to the, well, to the different uh, ideas of the community without breaking anything, so the, the perfect key management system in my opinion is completely uh, agnostic of what people want to do and is able to adapt very quickly uh, to those properties, so which might be a challenge when we consider a complete radical change of cryptographic systems because that is usually what is the most costly for a key management system. I mean, if you are just changing uh, the way you compute a transaction it's easy if you are moving from one elliptic curve for example to something completely different then you have to think about all the, all the consequences and the security so not only the performance uh, but we so well we are we are we today striving to build to build this and that's a complex part of, uh, of being in this industry I mean, everything moves very fast uh, i think i heard once in a conference that the problem before uh, before crypto was that the academic papers receiving a lot of feedbacks uh, did not see an implementation after a few years and now the problem with crypto is that we see academic papers with not a lot of feedback getting an, IC, getting an ICO in three months so that's kind of, we have to cope with that and we have to find a way to protect users from this and well let them test safely um, Is this microphone working as well as this one? No? No? No it's not could, could you repeat the question? I'm not sure I... Oh, so do I. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. I'll, tell, I'll make this one right. So the question was, um, how do you guys see these technologies interacting? But yeah, really, how, how do you see this all shaking up? Okay, um, I, I can answer only for, for Starkware. Um, I'll let you in on a secret. We did not do an ICO. And we were asked by many investors, including those who left, you know, and didn't want to invest, why aren't you doing an ICO? So we have this cool technology, offers immense scalability. We did not do an ICO. There are many reasons for that, but it's also an advice I'm sharing with all those projects out there. Think, you know, twice and thrice if, if it's really the right route for you to go. We believe at Starkware that this fundamental technology that offers scalability, also privacy, should be integrated in as many points. And we believe we might have a chance of forming a, you know, a profitable business from offering our scalability services across many layers and domains. And that's what we'd like to do. Um, so my advice to those out there, if you have a really cool technology or a new concept, I urge you to think really, really hard whether you can deploy it in a you know, meaningful way, in a way that is sustainable uh, across the various platforms already out there. And you know, if not, I urge you to try and massage it so that you can. That's the way I think the, uh, at least that's our approach to advancing our technology in this vibrant space with so many uh, amazing projects out there. So. You should build it into substrate so that other people can build with it. Well, okay, no, hang on to that. So, you, this is, I've just realized, you guys are all, um, you, you guys are all funded in different ways, right? Like, you guys have all got different, uh, different backgrounds and different ways of actually running your organizations. Tremendously so. Like, this, it's, I, I've just noticed that. So, 
Could you guys speak a little bit to the advantages, disadvantages, or the um, the the best approach that you guys kind of feel for um, running an organisation or, or, or funding a, uh, a project today? Well, Parity has a sort of weird relationship in funding because Parity Technologies, the company, we raised a small round of money in, in the early days, and we're uh, you know revenue focused. Essentially, we didn't do an ICO, we haven't done anything else. Um, but we also, like working on Polkadot, we're working closely with the Web3 Foundation, uh, which did do token sale and sort of sold the, the Polkadot tokens, uh, and they are the sort of stewards of that. So we uh, are essentially contractors making revenue off of doing work and implementation work. That's roughly our business model is building, building tech <laughs> for money in a traditional way. <laughs> Very strange. Um, but, um, when it comes to running organizations, and we were talking a little bit about this, or Ben and I were talking about this before, uh, it's an interesting thing in this space. I, I see a lot of companies do different things, but it's open source at the end of the day, and that's something that is very unique to deal with. And we're building open source code, everyone can access it, uh, and sort of the, the monetary the revenue models are completely different, so it's hard to figure out exactly how to organize things. And, um, we are very decentralized as a company, we are a very flat organization um, and love that culture. So it's, it's essentially an open source culture, just that you know, we have some sort of revenue model around it. So I'm familiar with two kinds of funding models. Uh, so I'm a co-founder and founding scientist of Zcash, which famously got very little funding and then did founder's reward mechanism. Now, if you're not going to take my first piece of advice, which is not to do your own coin, I mean, why would you? My own kids don't listen to me, so you guys probably won't either. But if you're already doing something, then please consider doing a founder's reward with vesting over time. It's much more uh, sensible from the point of view of the economy that you're trying to create. The other model I'm familiar with, the one we're following at Starkware, is the plain old boring vanilla, uh, you know, get funding in return for equity, uh, just like all, you know, pre-Bitcoin uh, 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 companies work. Um, I think there are a lot of advantages to that old model. It does require you to think hard about what will be uh, your business model and your recurring revenue and I think that's not necessarily a bad thing I mean you might just say we have this new technology we're gonna ICO and that's how we think it's gonna be fine if you try to go down the more conventional route you need to think a little bit harder and uh, I think it's a good thing so those are the two funding models I'm aware of from uh, you know, my own uh, perspective um, So uh, consensus has a slightly different model again. Uh, it's called find yourself a billionaire to uh, look after you. Um, you, uh, you may have heard yesterday we acquired a space exploration company. Every, every billionaire has to have one. Um, but in seriousness, we consensus is a venture production studio. So it exists to create, nurture businesses and spin them out. And that's uh, that's what we're doing. So there's this big safety net, which is you know Joe Rubin's uh, um, investments and so forth, and he is funding that. There are revenue streams, but the goal is to incubate and spin out companies. But also, it's important to nurture the ecosystem because without this ecosystem, you know the whole thing is pointless. So we're doing a lot of work on uh, things like Truffle um, and developer tooling. Uh, infra and projects like that simply to support the ecosystem uh, as well and education and consensus academy and so forth. So on this front I have actually no wisdom to give you give you guys. I think you guys know more than I do about business. I always viewed myself as a techie first foremost and solely actually. So um, uh, you know my advice to you, especially younger folks is just find yourself like-minded people and just go at it. Build stuff first. Build first. This is what how this is how my group distinguished itself in academics, and um, we always built our ideas down and to to code. So um, that's what I did, and I always see myself as a sort of scrappy academic, which is what we were until very recently. 
we got some seed funding for Ava, and, um, and so, and for blocks as well. So I don't know how that will pan out, or what we will do, whether we will ICO or not. So I don't really have, like, have any suggestions for you, but, uh, but build first. Yeah, I will just add something totally boring as well, so to support the old VC model. So Ledger is initially a hardware company, and uh, we are turning into an operating system company, but initially we are a hardware company. And VC, the VC model works very well for a hardware company because, of course, you have to well, you have to build your hardware, so you have to build a lot of pieces. You have to have the money at the right time. And having a VC has been having well a lot of good VCs. That's been very useful for us to grow our, our network. So I don't think that's something you can easily get from an ICO. So if you need more than the money, I would say to like well spread your technology, spread your product, and ship typically just ship and sell hardware everywhere. The VC model is very useful. Okay, so uh, one last question before we go and move on to the next panel. Um, what do you guys feel, or are there any particular projects <laughs> that you guys feel are not getting the attention that they deserve that are going to have a significant footprint on the future? I think Zcash doesn't get the attention it deserves. It gets a lot of attention, but it doesn't get enough. On the technical level, I would really like to see Bimble Wimble get more attention. Uh, perhaps just the name is not helping, but well, that's it. I think I drank too much wine to, you know, uh, I don't know, making predictions is very hard, especially about the future. I'll tell you in 10 years what was the, I don't know. So, um, I would name a lot of dApps, but I'm not going to go through them individually. You guys all know your own favorite little dApp that nobody has seen. Um, but generally, class-wise, I would say the non-fungible tokens are fantastic. Um, they're a great way to get, uh, get the masses to adopt. Um, DEXs are a very, very vibrant, exciting area. The current uh, spate of DEXs we have are a great start. We need to do much more research on that front to make sure that uh, they can be better than Wall Street. So if I may go on a, go on a short rant, um, something that's been happening is we keep going over in front of the SEC with an ETF. Right? Here's a Bitcoin ETF. Here's a Bitcoin ETF Prime. Here's, here's a slight tweak on another Bitcoin ETF. And they keep saying the same damn thing. They keep saying your exchanges are no good. And the funny thing is you can make your our exchanges much better than the best exchange Wall Street has got. We have the technology, right? These crypto assets are different. We know how to build trustless systems. Their technology works because of layers upon layers upon layers of regulators and auditors. Ours can work without trust. So there is an amazing, amazing possibility there. So, so we can help to the fiat world. And there are many other domains like this where we can help to the rest of the world. So go show them. <laughs> okay, serious answer. Um, and enter, enterprise blockchain, um, people are skeptical, people poo poo it, but it's a Trojan horse. We're not going to change the world until we change enterprise. And that uh, needs some uh, love and attention. It's very, very easy to get POCs and you know, um, concepts, but making them into production in enterprise is, is a long road, and we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, the other answer is, we love Definity. Definity is fantastic. It needs a lot of love. Uh, looking forward to it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, I think that wraps us up pretty much. But thanks so much, guys, for uh, joining us here. This is like a dream panel, basically. So, um, yeah, it's been a good one.